This is CBC Here and Now. The fate of nearly three dozen schools in this province is in legal limbo because of scandals connected to the Catholic Church. The schools are owned by the Episcopal Corporation. They too should be available to be, be sold or otherwise. I hope that, uh, you know, it doesn't jeopardize the education of, of the, the students in our province. I'm Terry Roberts. We'll have that story coming up. Since Danny's disappeared in 25 years, it's just a living hell. A sister's plea for her missing brother. A Labrador family is still looking for the missing piece in a 25-year-old cold case. This is a pretty big deal. Yeah, we're really excited. <laughs> and in 40 minutes, how researchers here are helping track down the rare colossal squid in the Antarctic. Welcome to Here and Now. Thousands of students in this province are attending schools that are now at the center of a court battle. It's a legacy of the old denominational education system and ongoing attempts to compensate those who are abused by Christian brothers and some parish priests. As Terry Roberts tells us, it has the potential to cause some serious disruption in the education system. This is Holy Spirit High in Conception Bay South. It's the end of the school day and more than 1,000 teenagers are filing out, one of the largest student bodies in the province. Now imagine a for sale sign tacked to the side of this big school, available to the highest bidder. It's a worst case scenario, but not out of the question. This symbol, school names like this one, hint at what it's all about. Religion, abuse scandals, legal battles, properties belonging to the Catholic Archdiocese in St. John's are being sold off. It's a court-supervised liquidation, with the Archdiocese facing up to 50 million in claims from more than 100 abuse victims. But there's another collection of properties that's so far been off-limits. And depending on how it plays out in the coming months, it has the potential to disrupt education. Large and prominent schools in St. John's, like Gonzaga, Mary Queen of Peace, and Beaconsfield. Schools in Mount Pearl, Conception Bay South. Rural schools on the Avalon Peninsula and a long list of schools on the Buren Peninsula, ranging from Marystown Central High to St. Anne's Allgrade in Southeast Bight. In all, nearly three dozen schools. Many still have their religious names, a throwback to an earlier era, Sacred Heart Elementary, St. Edward's Elementary, Christ the King. A total enrollment of almost 11,000 students, roughly 17% of all students in the province. If this St. John's lawyer has his way, these schools will play a significant role in making sure his clients get the money they deserve. They too should be available to be, be sold or otherwise compensated for so that the survivors of abuse themselves can be compensated. It's an unsettling circumstance for the Federation of School Councils. I hope that, uh, you know, it doesn't jeopardize the education of, of the, the students in our province. Let's rewind now to the 90s. After years of controversy and debate and two referendums, the denominational school system is abolished. The days of church-run schools funded with public money comes to an end. But a law is passed allowing these spaces, still owned by the church, to be occupied as long as they're needed. A quarter century later, 33 schools are now in legal limbo. The Roman Catholic Episcopal Corporation of St. John's, the Archdiocese land-holding arm, is the registered owner. There's disagreement over whether the schools should be included in this fire sale. Lawyers for the district and province are opposed, saying the Schools Act is clear. But this lawyer says if the victims are to be fairly compensated, the schools have to be included. The best case for the survivors and for the, uh, the people of Newfoundland and for the children who attend these schools is that there be a resolution that uh, allows the schools to continue to be used as schools, but the ownership interest the Episcopal Corporation has would also be recognized and compensated for. In other words, the province writes a big check, one that solidifies its ownership of schools like this one, avoids any disruptions for students like these, and ensures legal claims are settled. A two-day hearing on this matter is scheduled for Supreme Court in February, so this all could be decided by a judge. But all sides are talking, so an out-of-court settlement is possible. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Conception Bay South. 
Well, Premier Andrew Fury hosted a high-profile guest at Confederation Building today, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. He met with the Premier and members of Cabinet today. These photos were posted on social media, but the reason given for the visit was vague. The Premier tweeted they discussed how to create transformative change and support people during these challenging times. Now, the former Prime Minister now works as the executive chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, which is an organization focused on supporting policymakers around the world. Well, the provincial opposition party is reacting to a story we brought you last night on the ongoing health care crisis. The leader of the Progressive Conservative Party says government has dropped the ball and should be scrambling to ensure health care workers stay in the province. Five respiratory therapists have recently quit because they're overworked and underpaid. But that's according to their union. The union also told CBC that other provinces are aggressively recruiting new respiratory therapy graduates from Newfoundland and Labrador. And we're asking this administration to be proactive. Start working with all the key components here, all the key agencies and health professionals here to find solutions to the issues that we have in healthcare here. Show respect for the healthcare professionals that are trained in Newfoundland and Labrador, and particularly for those who are in the healthcare uh, training facilities right now. Give them. Well, some COVID news now. Five more people have died from COVID-19 in the province since last week's update. All five were over the age of 70. Three lived in the Central Health region, while the other two fell under Eastern Health. There are now 19 people in hospital because of COVID. Six of those people are in critical care. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Heather Gillis in for Ashley Brawweiler tonight. Let's take a look at the weather that is on the way. Tonight is going to be cold. It's going to be very cold. It's also going to be cloudy. We're going to be seeing increasing cloud across much of the island. It's going to be probably minus 13, 14 here on the east coast with a wind chill overnight feeling like minus 16 to minus 18 if you're in central Newfoundland. And that is all ahead of rain and wind warnings that are going to sweep across the province, mostly on Thursday, starting early tomorrow morning for the southwest coast. This system also bringing 15 to 25 centimeters of snow to Nain. Here you go. You can see all of those watches and warnings from Environment Canada perimeter of the island, really getting a wind warning, some rain warning up to 30 to 50 millimeters of rain for the southwest coast. We'll tell you all about it a little later in here and now. Thanks, Heather. Well, Danny Galton has been missing for 25 years. Decades ago, the Labrador City man went west for work and later went missing in Grand Prairie. There have been rumors over the years about what happened, but one piece of the puzzle has eluded his family. Now, a podcast about missing people now hopes to stir up memories and more information. Here and now's Daryl Din has that story. Danny Galton set out on a dream to find work in Alberta as a correctional officer. He's remembered as a jovial guy who made friends easily wherever he went. Then he just vanished without a trace. 25 years later, his family lives with the hope of finding out what happened and having closure on this dark chapter in their lives. His sister accepts he's no longer alive. What she wants is to be able to bury his remains. That's kind of not important to us right now. I'm not going to say down the road it won't be, but right now, and what has been for 25 years, is to bring Danny home, put him to rest with our mother and the rest of our family, and to bring some closure to our life. Because since Danny's disappeared in 25 years, it's just a living hell. But what about those that just aren't found? The mothers and fathers, sons and daughters who disappear without a trace. These are the cases that we really need your help to solve. I'm Ellen White, and you are listening to Whereabouts Unknown. Ellen White's podcast is all about missing people. She stumbled across Danny Galton's story a few years ago. Her episode about the case opened a flood of potential tips. We put out some social media pod, uh, some social media posts about Danny, and we were um, surprised to find that really within the hour, people were reaching out to us on this 20-something-year-old case, saying, listen, I was there. I saw what happened. And from that, it really just snowballed. White figures she spoke to about 150 tipsters. All of them tell the same story. The tipsters that we spoke with for the most part uh, did say that sadly Danny was no longer with us. And we do absolutely believe that to be true. Danny would not ever have left this huge family that he loves, his uh, friends, his co-workers. 
uh, he would never have just disappeared on his own. After 25 years, where does the police investigation stand? The RCMP in Grand Prairie did not respond to repeated requests for comment on the Galton Cold case. All those years ago, Danny was last seen at the now demolished Park Hotel in Grand Prairie, Alberta. It was a November night. He was at the bar. After that, he and his 1985 Gold Chrysler LeBaron disappeared. His sister feels it's now time for the people who know something to speak up. Things have changed. I know back then if Hell's Angels were involved and everything, yeah, I'm sure some people were afraid for their lives. But we kind of feel 25 years later, a lot of things have changed. Players have changed. Like I said, people are not alive. There's one thing that has not changed in the effort to find the truth about what happened to Danny Galton. And that's the reward. $100,000 for the information of the whereabouts of Danny Galton's body. And a reward for the family. Closure. Daryl Din, CBC News, Labrador City. The province has lost another war veteran, the second in less than a week. John Pinhorn of Winterton was a gunner with the 166th Royal Newfoundland Artillery Regiment during the Second World War. He trained in England and North Africa and was part of the Battle of Monte Cassino, a fight that killed tens of thousands of people from both Allied and German forces. After the war, Pinhorn returned home to Winterton and fished for a living. He was 101 years years old when he died on Monday at the Memorial Pavilion in Carbonier. Earlier this week, we told you about the death of 100-year-old veteran Charlie Starks of Mount Pearl, who also passed away. And in other news, there was an unscheduled change in some fuel prices this morning. The PUB has lowered the maximum cost of diesel by 8.2 cents a litre. Furnace and stove oil are also down by 6.5 cents a litre. The board says the change is due to commodity market developments. Now on the Avalon, diesel now costs nearly $2.64 a litre, while furnace oil is just over $1.47 a litre. Stove oil is just above a dollar and 50 cents a liter. And today is the last day to submit applications to the Provincial Home Heating Supplement Program. That money is available to residents with a family income of $150,000 or lower who've paid for the cost of furnace or stove oil for their homes. Eligible homes could receive up to $500. Applications can be submitted online or emailed to oilsupplement at gov.nl.ca. Well, residents of the Battery say they've been blinded on purpose. Members of the downtown neighborhood have begun a petition urging city staff to take action. Now, the group alleges that a businessman who has purchased properties in the Battery has purposefully harassed neighbors. Now, residents say bright lights near the North Head Trail are on 24-7, and they've been for the last seven months, and the city refuses to get involved. These lights are not security lights or anything of that kind. They're two parking lot lights. These lights are 20,000 lumens each. Your, your average um, security light is 700 to 1,000. So these lights are two of them. They're both 20 times more powerful than security lights. And uh, they're interfering with people's uh, sleep and, uh, uh, and our enjoyment of our property and uh, shining in everyone's windows. This battery back and forth has been going on for months and some residents are even in court over disputes with that new neighbor. So what they want to see, what do they want to see from the city? That's ahead in about 10 minutes on Here and Now.
time for a look at the weather with Heather. And it was a <laughs> bitterly cold start to the day in St. John's today, but turned into a really nice sunny day. It did indeed. And it's cold out there now. It was actually even colder uh, in Labrador West. I think they hit minus 31 uh, <laughs> this morning, feeling like minus 40 for them with the wind chill. Uh, we can take a look at t today's current uh, temperatures here now. We're in the freezer. Uh, it is freezing everywhere. Minus five here in St. John's, minus six uh, as well in some parts of uh, eastern Newfoundland. Getting a little cooler into central Newfoundland, minus 11 and minus eight in uh, Badger and Deer Lake, respectively. Getting chillier yet again as we get into western Labrador, minus 14, minus 15. And it's going to feel even colder uh, tonight for many parts of the island and into Labrador when you factor in the wind chill. So bundle up if you are heading out. Let's take a look at our future tracker now. It's cloudy now for central and parts of the west coast and we're going to have an increasing cloudy trend develop across the island and here into Labrador City. We're going to start to see some snow around seven, eight o'clock tonight. And this here is going to sweep right across the island tomorrow and bring uh, a bit of a mess. Uh, a windy, nasty sort of day in store for tomorrow. So let's take a look at tonight. Minus eight here in St. John's again. We're going to see increasing cloud push across the island into tonight. Our temperature is going to be minus 11 in Grand Falls. Winds are dipping down uh, into central Newfoundland places. Minus 16, minus 17 with the wind chill. So going to be pretty cold night, a bit warmer uh, on the west coast and into Labrador you can feel with your wind chill values between minus 17 to minus 22 tonight. Uh, cloudy skies for much of Labrador as well. And you see we start those flurries in Labrador West as that system starts to push across Labrador uh, in the overnight. Now, six o'clock, seven o'clock tomorrow morning, southwest coast, we're going to start to see the rain. So let's take a look at the future tracker and see how that's going to map out by lunchtime tomorrow. We're going to have some heavy rain across much of the southwest coast where we could pick up 30, 40, 50 millimeters of rain from Burgio Ramia to the Port of Basque area where you'll see the heaviest amounts of rain and you'll be seeing that snow pushing from Churchill Falls into Happy Valley Goose Bay and up along the coast there as well. And that's going to sweep into central Buren Bonavista Peninsula's Thursday night and then finally to the Avalon uh, between then and the midnight hours. So taking a look at our wind gust, it's going to be very windy as well. We've got some wind warnings issued by Environment Canada. Tomorrow, we're going to see gusts up to 130 for the wreck house. We could even see, you know, around 100, uh, 80 to 100 here for the West Coast by, you know, mid morning into the lunch hour. And then by, you know, tomorrow evening, about this time tomorrow evening, we're going to see gusts 80 to 100 into central Buren, Bonavista Peninsulas and the Avalon Peninsula. And then that moves off as we head on into Friday. So taking a look at our rainfall projections here, you really see all of that rain there for the southwest coast here on the east coast. We'll be picking up, you know, five to ten, uh, but majority of that rain for the west coast. Taking a look at tomorrow now, uh, cloudy for the east coast here and the Avalon, about six degrees here, five uh, for Bonavista, picking up a chance of showers in Marystown at seven. Uh, and and we're going to have a cloudy conditions for Gander and East there as well. But Grand Falls, Windsor, you'll be picking up two millimeters of rain in the afternoon. So will Harbor Breton. Moving a little further west where all the action is, we're going to see that 30 to 40 in Burgio, 40 to 50 for Port A little bit less rain for Stephenville, 10 to 15 for you. And as we head up the west coast and into the northern peninsula, less again, 5 to 10 between Cornerbrook and Gross Moor. And as we move up the northern peninsula, you could see two millimeters of rain, but there's a pocket here for Lancelou that could bring about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain to you folks. You might see a bit of a mix there in Cartwright as we head into tomorrow. Now, 15 to 25 centimeters for, for Nain, zero degrees for you. But a little further south in Makovic, what you'll see is you'll see some snow, some ice pellets. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a nasty day for you folks, possibly some freezing rain there as well. Uh, snow in the morning for Happy Valley Goose Bay, changing to rain as we go a little bit further west here. Could see a bit of a mix in Churchill Falls, and it'll be mostly uh, snow, about five centimeters for Labrador West. And you can see all that snow pushing through uh, Labrador there as well with your snowfall totals. You see all that snow accumulation there for Nain. We'll have a look at your long-term forecast a little later in the show.
Well, I'm here in the historic Battery in St. John's. Of course, a beautiful place right by the harbor, a historic community, very famous in Canada, actually right around the world. And joining me are two residents because there's a problem here, a conflict with one neighbor who's made life here a bit miserable. Some very, very bright lights behind us that just can't seem to be doused for some reason or other. It's resulted in a petition. And joining me now are Christina Smith and Judith Adler. So, Christina, I'll start with you. Uh, what's, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is we've had these uh, incredibly bright lights in the outer battery shining for the past seven months. And uh, these lights are not security lights or anything of that kind. They're two parking lot lights. These lights are 20,000 lumens each. Your, your average um, security light is 700 to 1,000. So these lights are two of them. They're both 20 times more powerful than security lights. And uh, they're interfering with people's uh, sleep and, uh, and our enjoyment of our property and uh, shining in everyone's windows. And uh, it's, uh, it's a really bad for our health because nobody can sleep. And it's just a terrible situation. And we need these lights turned off. No, I went up around the, the hill here and I took a look in these, at these lights and I st I'm still able to see little blue dots where, where I actually focused in on them. So here we are. It's a bright, beautiful, sunny day and you can still see them. Um, Judith, you've, been, you've lived here for quite a while, right? I've lived here since 1973. Okay, that counts. Um, what's going on here? Uh, what's going on? Uh, a, a harassment is going on and a, and a degradation of the pleasure of living in this wonderful place. Now, there's a certain individual who's bought up some property here. Now, for legal reasons, let's try to avoid naming him, even though his name is in the public and on social media and before the courts. Um, what's your sense of what he's trying to do? My, my sense is that this, it's not so important to talk about an individual because uh, the, the thing that has struck me and a number of other people is the uh, slowness with which our city has been able to address a problem. I, there are always individuals who, who cause problems, but that's not really the, the story here. I think the story is that the, the city has to help neighbors address a serious problem. I mean, for example, my, my facility Position. My family doctor said nobody should have lights of that intensity shining into their bedroom windows. This city needs bylaws about light trespass and light pollution, and that would help protect everybody. It's, it's unbelievably awful to have to live with. And uh, uh, the, the fact that the city has done nothing is, is really egregious. Here we are, and uh, like, like my mother would say, we're, we're like the cow's tail. You know, most every other city in North America already has lights and or regulations about lights, and uh, and we don't. Um, the uh, city of Mississauga, for example, uh, if you do this, they will charge you. They may charge you up to ten thousand dollars for a first infraction. And uh, in Montreal, I know two people who this has happened to, and uh, the problem is always solved within twenty-four hours. So we we really have no idea why it's taking so long for the city to get some attention on this. Again, I don't think it's a matter of speculating about the motives of uh, individual people. What's happened out here is cruel. That's what one of my neighbors said, whose, whose, whose husband was dying and begged for the lights to be turned off. Begged for the lights to be turned off, and they weren't turned off. So there's cruelty and there's abuse taking place here. But what the motive of any cruel person is, who knows? The issue is that you need laws and regulations to protect people from cruelty. I mean, surely the city has to say something other than you can't break a law that doesn't exist or a bylaw that doesn't exist. Well, they did say that uh, um, they couldn't regulate lights because of the City of St. John's Act. And the City of St. John's Act mentions things like not tying your horse across the sidewalk and... Um, uh, and making sure you have lights on your carriage. But it does, they said it didn't mention lights. Well, I found a regulation. Uh, regulation 8.8C from the development regulations say that you cannot have uh, lights uh, that uh, trespass onto a neighbor's property from a parking lot outside the downtown area. Well, if they can make a bylaw about one uh, thing concerning lights, well, they can make another one. So they came back to me when I told them this and said, yes, we can make a regulation. Only... Um, the lights that exist already will have to be grandfathered in. Judith, I'll give you the last word on this. What, what's the solution here? What, how, how does this get put to rest? It put, gets put to rest by uh, bystanders to harassment and cruelty and trespass, not saying, I want to be neutral, there's nothing I can do. It gets put to rest by people taking action and, uh, and taking care of each other. All right. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you.
one point he did tell his staff, you know, I want to have my, 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 my wife here. What a forced separation means for couples who've spent decades together and why another province decided to do more to keep them united in long-term care. I can tell you the feedback from families uh, has been incredible. That's coming up the next part of the CBC series Concerning Care. Well, tonight we continue our special series concerning care. It's a close look at folks who are trying to navigate home and respite care in the province and the diverse challenges they're facing. Tonight we have a story about a longtime disabilities advocate who now has to advocate for his own family. Joining me now is CBC producer Alicia Dix. So Alicia, tell us about this person and the challenges that they're going through. This story is about Cecil Witten and his wife, Tina Witten, and the challenges that they're going through. Um, he is a longtime disability advocate and champion. He's been on here now many, many times, and now he's having some issues of his own with his family life. 
So Alicia, I understand that Cecil has some concerns that he could be separated from his wife when they move into long-term care. Yes, Carolyn, that's correct. So just imagine if your parents were moving into long-term care, being separated after being married for 20 years, and now they're having to think about the next steps and what that might look like. And they're really concerned about being separated and away from each other. My name is Cecil. I'm a retired educator. I'm 74 years old. My disability is CP. My wife is spina bifida. We've been married for 20 years. We've been together for 24 years. My wife at the moment has a few more issues than I have. And we're getting to the point now where we're starting to consider what our options will be. But the next step is going to be if something uh, more happened to my wife or if something happened to me, if I had a fall or something, and somebody said, you can't go home anymore. Our concern is basically that we're, one partner is at a different level of care uh, than the other one. The way things are organized in this province right now, we would be separated. We may be in the same home together, but we wouldn't be together on the same floor or together in the same room. This is my understanding. Can you paint me a picture of how you deal with the care aspect currently? Uh, right now, we're very fortunate. We have a home care worker four hours a week, and I do the cooking. I've been cooking since I was a young fella, and I love it. When the time comes that we decide, okay, it isn't financially feasible to stay here or one of the partners has a change in peer level. It's better to try and plan ahead than it is to have to do it. You know, oh my God, we've got to do it now and boom. To separate two people, whether they have a disability or whether they don't, to separate two people at a point in their life when they're most vulnerable. If it's inconscionable to me that it could be done and there should be a solution found. And what do you think the solution should be? What do you think the province needs to do in helping people with disabilities and the aging population? It's not just a disabled issue, it's an issue for everybody that's aging. While there are things that are unique to people with disabilities, there are commonalities, and you could bring the two together, maybe you can find a better way. Well, you just heard from a couple who is still living in their own home in St. John's, but thinking ahead to what might happen once one of them has to enter long-term care. There are many families in the province who already had to go through a separation. Meanwhile, in another Atlantic province, a law prevents elderly couples from being split up against their will. And we'll get to that in a few moments, but first, here now, Samrika Wilhelm spoke with one family who knows the stress and strain of separation. So, Enrique, can you describe what they went through? Yeah, it means that uh, not just are people moving out of a familiar environment, uh, their home, into the unknown, but also that they have to do it by themselves, leaving behind their partner of often 50 or 60 years. And that can have a detrimental impact on people's mental and also physical health. One family who went through this are the Wills from Portugal Cove St. Phillips. Ray Will had Parkinson's disease. His wife, Delia, has dementia. For a few years, they lived together in a personal care home here in St. John's, but when Ray's Parkinson's progressed and he lost his mobility in February, he had to be moved into a long-term care home and Delia had to stay behind. I spoke to their son, Gavin Will, about how difficult that was for them and the entire family. Once my father moved in, 
moved out, there was a there was a definite decline in both of them. Uh, my mother didn't understand what was happening. My sister put signs on posters and left them in the room saying that her husband uh, could be reached by phone. He wasn't here, but he was still alive. She she wasn't sure whether he was alive or dead, that kind of thing. And it was it was it was it was very distressing, very hard in the family. And my father too. He was uh, he just felt so frustrated by by this, and uh, he. He asked, he, at one point he did tell staff, you know, I want to have my, 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 my wife here. And they said, well, sorry, this, you can't be done. And there was nothing he could do about it. In October then, Ray Will died and Delia now lives in a long-term care facility. Okay, so what did Gavin Will say he wants to see happen in this province? Yeah, so Will started a petition pushing for legislation change that allows couples to stay together in long-term care. That was when he was fighting for his parents to be reunited. And it was introduced in the House of Assembly twice without success. Even though it is too late for his own parents now, Will is still pushing for this legislation change. John Hagee, I think, was asked about this. And he said, well, it would take 10 years to get it done. Well, the Liberals have been in power since 2015. So they're now in year seven, going to year eight. They could have had it almost done. It was going to take 10 years. But it doesn't take 10 years. All it takes is commitment. All it takes is a, a decision to, that you believe that this is an important issue and you're going to do something about it. This is actually something that can be done. You just have to decide as a, as a, as a society and as a government that you want to make it happen. And one government did make it happen. Nova Scotia made changes there. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Nova Scotia made changes last year. In March 2021, the Life Partners in Long-Term Care Act took effect. It says that spouses, common law partners, and domestic partners stay together in long-term care, no matter their care needs. The couple is placed together according to the highest level of care needed by one of them. And if one partner moves into facility before the other, the one staying behind has priority to move into the same home once it's time for them. I spoke to Nova Scotia's Liberal leader, Zach Churchill, who was health minister when the act took effect, and he says the change has been a success. The feedback from families uh, has been incredible. You know, just, just think about couples who have been married for 40, 50 plus years, been together nearly every day of their lives, having to separate because they had different needs in the long-term care system. Uh, tragic and very sad when that happens. And for us to change that and to ensure that that couples at the time when they probably needed each other the most could, could, could spend the rest of their lives together, it was really, I think, uh, moving uh, for a lot of people. Yeah, Churchill says this change was fairly straightforward, especially since all three parties in the legislature supported the act. It just required uh, a law to be passed. Uh, then, of course, you have to go through the, the logistics and making sure that couples can stay together and connecting people who had been previously separated. The, the major challenges were in terms of room availability and ensuring that we had space to accommodate couples. And our staff worked very hard to ensure that that could happen. And what about back here in this province? What does this situation look like here? Is there any hope for couples that there could be a legislation change? Well, provincially, things are less advanced with no concrete timeline or plan to change the status quo. Health Minister Tom Osborne spoke to CBC News at the end of October, where he signaled understanding of the implications for couples. And Osborne says the health department is currently doing a review of the Nova, Nova Scotia model, as well as the provincial personal and long-term care models to see whether changes are possible. Right now, uh, I am looking for answers. My, my parents um, are both senior citizens, and at some point, um, you know, may have to avail of long-term care. I would not want to see them, um, having been married for more than 50 years, uh, be separated. So, you know, it's it's obviously something we understand. Looking at what Nova Scotia did to see if uh, if that, you know, can be put in place here. Uh, I don't know if they have greater capacity and were able to do it easier. Uh, if changing our models will allow us to do that. 
In a statement to CBC News, the health department said that under exceptional circumstances where a spouse does not meet the care requirements, they may be considered for placement where it has been determined that separation is detrimental to a spouse. But it also added that at this time, the regional health authorities could only consider this process when no other person with higher care needs is waiting for long-term care placement in that particular home. In most cases, there is a wait list for these homes. Carolyn? Thank you so much, Enrica. Thank you. And we'll be bringing you more stories from the series concerning care over the coming weeks on Here and Now, CBC Radio, and on our website, cbc.ca slash nl. And if you would like to share your own story dealing with home and respite care, you can contact Enrica at care-struggles at cbc.ca. to be standing there on our like looking at the little screen and then just see this like nice hooked arm. Coming up next, researchers in this province are heading south to help find a rare sea creature. A team 
team from Newfoundland and Labrador is en route to the Antarctic Ocean in search of one of nature's most elusive creatures, the colossal squid. It can weigh more than 500 kilograms, yet it has never been filmed in the frigid waters it calls home. But this expedition is about more than the video. It's also about exploring a cheaper and greener way to do science in hard to reach places. Here now Zach Gowdy has the story. Somewhere in the Antarctic Ocean lives the colossal squid, a creature so rare and mysterious that it has never been filmed in its natural habitat. But on the other side of the world, in Clarenville, Newfoundland and Labrador, a team is gunning to be the first. I'm expecting us to be standing there on our, like looking at the little screen and then just see this like nice hooked arm come and just the grab beak. the, yeah, <laughs> the beak. That would be really exciting. That would be epic. At the offices of Subsea Imaging, marine scientists Jennifer Herbig and Eugenie Jacobson and engineer Brent Lockie are going over the final details before setting off on a colossal expedition. So Jenny and I and the folks at Subsea are going to Antarctica to look for colossal squid, which is the largest, meaning the heaviest invertebrate in the world. How big a deal is this for you guys? This is a pretty big deal. Yeah, we're really excited. <laughs> yeah. I think the first discovery of the colossal squid was like in 1925. So it's been a long time coming that we haven't been able to capture this organism on film and really characterize what it's doing. So I think it would be a huge, mm -hmm. huge discovery. In 2013, scientists famously captured the world's first video of the giant squid. Both species of squid are extremely rare, but giant squid have longer tentacles and live around the world, while colossal squid is much heavier, around 500 kilograms, and lives only in the Antarctic. Hi there world, I'm Matt Mulrennan, a marine scientist and co-founder and CEO of Colossal, an ocean exploration and conservation nonprofit. Matthew Mulrennan has been planning this project for the past seven years. But while he's based in sunny California, much of the expertise he's assembled is coming from Newfoundland and Labrador, where cold water science is a specialty. Herbig and Jacobson are graduate students at Memorial University's Marine Institute. They were at the Earth's other pole doing research in the Arctic on board a Canadian Coast Guard vessel when they got the call for Colossal. There are very few people who get the opportunity to go down and study Antarctica and deploy a camera from a ship um, and see what's down there and characterize everything. So it's a really unique opportunity. Mm -hmm. Did you imagine you'd get opportunities like this when you signed up at Marine Institute? No. no. <laughs> then there's the camera. Colossal squid isn't going to swim up to the surface for a selfie, so subsea imaging has created a rig that can stand up to the rigors of the Antarctic Ocean. So environment is generally very dark. Once you get down about 400 meters, there's very little to any sunlight that filters down that far. So we have two very powerful lights on our frame system. We will have bait attached out in front of the camera and hopefully, hopefully, we'll see the colossal squid uh, taking some of that bait. The final piece of the puzzle is getting there. But the team isn't taking a research vessel to the Antarctic. They're hitching a ride on a cruise ship, the Ocean Endeavour. While the cruise passengers spend their days spotting penguins and sipping cocktails, the members of Project Colossal will be below deck, trying to spot the colossal squid on their underwater camera. We think this is one of the best platforms to do it because it, they're already going down there. So it's very low carbon, uh, right? To get to Antarctica, is, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and so it's an incredibly efficient way to do research. It's a model that's catching on, using adventure tourism to subsidize science. Last summer, Subsea Imaging's cameras were used on another expedition that took researchers and well-heeled tourists to the wreck of the Titanic. This is a new field, right, is doing research off of tourism vessels, but the research vessels can cost tens of thousands of dollars each day. Matthew, what would it mean to capture this animal on video? You know, this if, if finding the giant squid was like landing on the moon, finding colossal squid is like landing on Mars. The challenge is colossal, but so would be the reward. 
one of nature's largest and most elusive creatures finally glimpsed by a camera from Newfoundland and Labrador, and then by the world. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Clarenville. Tomorrow on CBC Radio's Labrador Morning, the Better Business Bureau is warning about an increase in Facebook scams. Before we have a look at our weather, let's head out west. BC's south coast was hit hard with an early blast of winter knocking out power for tens of thousands and causing traffic chaos. Watch out! <laughs> Scenes like this one in Surrey unfolded across the region last night. Some travelers found themselves stuck for hours, trapped in their vehicles from accidents and blocked roadways. The northern part of Vancouver Island was hardest hit by heavy snow and high winds. Some areas saw up to 25 centimeters of snow and wind gusts between 70 to 100 kilometers per hour. Wow. 
not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how used to that kind of weather they are. We're certainly no. used to it out here. We are, yeah. And, I mean, we've got some of that weather in our forecast, yeah. 15 to 25 for Nain. And then, uh, you know, the southwest coast is going to get a lot of rain. They're not going to get snow, but they're going to get winds to that effect. Yeah. But, yeah, we're, I guess, more used to uh, and, and ready for weather like that. Uh, but let's take a look ahead now, mm -hmm. getting a little closer to our weekend, see what's in store here. Uh, as we look ahead on Thursday evening, that's all of that rain passing off, uh, offshore as we head into Friday. Let's take a closer look at Friday now. It looks like it's going to be a bit of a cloudy day for much of the island and a little bit more mild uh, on Friday than it is uh, in the overnight tonight for certain. Uh, two in St. John's with a mix of sun and cloud. A chance of flurries for most parts of the island uh, on Friday including Marystown into central Newfoundland and the west coast. As we get up into Labrador, though, it looks like we'll have um, some more sun, a mix of sun and cloud, temperatures in the minus digits, minus one in the Straits, minus three in Cartwright, as cold as minus six in Nain, and it looks like we will have some flurries as well in Labrador City Walbush area at minus one on Friday. Now, looking ahead to Saturday when most people have a day off, uh, it looks like that's going to be a nice day for many parts of the island uh, with a mix of sun and cloud for much of the island. A little bit warmer again. Temperatures two degrees in St. John's on the Avalon, a little bit cooler into central Newfoundland uh, and into the west coast. It looks like temperatures will be similar there. Getting chillier as we go farther north into St. Anthony in the Straits. Cartwright two degrees minus two up in Nain. Looks like you could have some sun there looking like a nice day but as we get into happy valley goose bay it looks like you could see a chance of flurries there and a chance of flurries in labrador city wabush area as well it looks like it could be a mix here with this little bit of pink precipitation now taking a look at our five day forecast tomorrow December 1st, can you believe it? Looks like it will be a cloudy day for much of the day with some rain moving in tonight, uh, or tomorrow night, excuse me. Six degrees, a low of one. Temperatures cooling off for the remainder of the week with a mix of sun and cloud into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Some rain clouds for you on Monday. Temperatures on Friday, Saturday, though, look pretty chilly overnight. Moving into central Newfoundland now, it looks like you're going to have more precipitation. That rain on Thursday, a chance of flurries on Friday, Saturday looking nice, but some uh, another chance of rain moving in on Sunday and a mix on Monday. For western Newfoundland, your forecast looks very similar to central, but it looks like you'll have a bit of a better Monday. On into Labrador now, if you're in eastern Labrador, that snow rain mix on Thursday, decent Friday with a mix of sun and cloud for you and some precipitation to round out your weekend. Looks like you'll see lots of snowflakes in Labrador West throughout your week and a mix of sun and cloud on Monday. Now let's take a look at your weather photo. It's the sun setting in Carbonier. It's the late afternoon sun and the sun is setting at about quarter, a little bit around quarter after four uh, these days. 413 to be exact, I believe. And this photo comes to us from Glennis Walsh. And if you have any photos that you'd like to send to us, you can do so at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you very much, Glennis, for that. And yes, tomorrow, December 1st. Mm -hmm. <sighs> wow. <laughs> do you have your Christmas decorations up yet? No. No, I've started. I've noticed around town yeah. a few people have Got them up, so I guess, uh, yeah, it is yeah. the season. You see the odd <laughs> Christmas tree uh, yeah. now. But yeah, I've got the shopping started, which is the main part. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Hope you have a great night. Good night. <laughs>